So now let's move towards our fourth keynote session. I would like to call Dr. Manjusha Nair for chairing this session. Dr. Manjusha is Assistant Professor Selection Grade at Amrita School of Computer Sciences. She is one of the main coordinators of Amrita Online Education Initiative, AHEAD. She has pursued PhD in Computational Neuroscience and also works as an associated faculty at Amrita Mindbrain Center. So I heartily invite Dr. Manjusha Nair for chairing the session. Yeah, thank you, Mahima, for the pleasant introduction. So with immense pleasure and gratitude, let me invite Dr. Egidio D'Angelo to another very exciting and prestigious keynote address of our conference. Dr. Egidio D'Angelo is a full professor of physiology, co-chair of the Department of Brain and Behavioral Sciences, and the director of Brain Connectivity Center of IRCCS Montigno. Professor D'Angelo coordinates brain research at the international level and has uninterruptedly coordinated nine European projects and several national projects of the Italian Ministry of Health, of the Ministry of the University Research and other institutions over this 1995 to 2022 period. In the last 20 years, Professor D'Angelo has participated as co-partner and co-director in the European flagship Human Brain Project. Professor D'Angelo is also a core partner of CERN, Cerebellum and Emotional Networks, the consortium which brings together researchers to address the contribution of cerebellum in the control of emotions. Professor D'Angelo published around 200 peer-reviewed papers in high-quality journals and presented his research at several meetings worldwide. His main scientific interests are centered on the cellular and circuit functions of the cerebellum and its pathologies in the context of all brain activity. Professor, once again, a very warm welcome to the conference and we are all here to listen to you. Professor, welcome to the stage. So thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you also, Shyam, for the invitation and all of you for the invitation. It's a really uh, great occasion to be with you today. Uh, and uh, it has been a, green, a great occasion when I was visiting Amrita a couple of years ago. Hope it will happen again. Uh, I just uh, would like to remind that uh, uh, with uh, Shyam, we've done a great uh, um, work in the last years and uh, still going on today. Uh, and uh, so uh, what is presented here is also the evolution of what we did together a couple of years ago. So um, what I will be talking today is about um, brain modeling. Uh, what is brain modeling and why we need brain modeling? Sorry, um, uh, sorry, Gidi, is it possible to have the mic closer? Some of the people have commented to us saying- Like this, you... probably yes. better now. Thank you, yes, thank you. Okay, yeah. I will keep it very close to my mouth. Um, so what I will be speaking today is about uh, uh, brain modeling. So the point is what is brain modeling and why we need brain modeling to understand the brain. Uh, this will become clear in the next slides. Um, first of all, um, I would like to start from the big questions of neuroscience, which the biggest question is how does the brain work? The brain is producing uh, motor and sensory functions, is generating consciousness, is generating cognition, emotion. So how does it work? This is the very big question. This is the question that every body of us is uh, facing in different ways, working at the cellular level, working at the molecular level, the system level. So the point is that we can uh, uh, subdivide this question into smaller questions. For example, questions that can be tractable. So the big question is untractable. We can't deal with it, but we can deal with smaller questions. For example, when the brain is activated. That's very important. Suppose that we are performing a task we are uh, exploiting our cognitive system, our emotional capabilities. So then we can see when the brain and when parts of the brain are active inside these operations. 
So what does the brain compute? So move on the computational side. The brain is a computational system. And what is, is it computing? How does the brain operate? Now we go on the mechanisms, which means we are going into the core of the system and we're trying to understand how the elements of the system build up the computations, which build up the functions. So basically, we're trying to ask how the brain computes to motor control and higher brain functions by asking sub questions. And finally, answering this question may be useful in the future. We are confident it is useful in the future for help, help medicine and uh, ICT. Um, the, one of the most important things that happened in the last two decades is uh, the uh, application of uh, uh, magnetic resonance imaging to brain investigation. Uh, together with other high level techniques, uh, uh, magnetic resonance imaging or MRI is helping us to understand how the brain works. But you will see that it is not the only element that is important in this uh, uh, field. Uh, look at this picture. Um, the hard issue is that the brain is organized multi scale. Is organized multi-scale, which means that it is made of uh, molecules that build up subcellular structures. These build up neurons and glial cells. These neurons and glial cells that set up networks and tissues. And these tissues finally generate the computations that are important for brain function. So these uh, neurons and cells set up a micro circuits that are organized on the micro scale, then on the meso scale, and they are connected on the uh, macro scale. Correspondingly, we have tools to investigate the single neurons, like here, bottom left, single cell recordings, to investigate the multitudes of neurons, like here, with a multi spot to photon laser confocal microscope, or to investigate the whole brain. For example, using MRI or using electroencephalography. This kind of measurements give us different insight into the brain functioning. Uh, we can understand very well what the neuron is doing, what a small cohort of neuron is doing, or what the brain is doing. So now the point is how to connect these levels together. You will see soon that either we use models or we remain disconnected. Um, I would like to give you more insight on what uh, MRI is doing. This is an example of the use of MRI to reconstruct the brain connectomics. Connectomics is a term that indicates how the different parts of the brain are wired together. This is an example of wiring of the cerebellum that is bottom uh, here with the cerebral cortex that is here on top. These connections uh, are um, explored using anatomy, histology, physiology, MRI now. Uh, and this is a picture that was taken in our laboratories a couple of years ago from a precise reconstruction of the connections between the cerebellum and the cerebral cortex. You will soon understand why I will speak quite profusely about the cerebellum. It's important in terms of uh, brain functioning and uh, contains about half of the neurons of the brain. Uh, and for some reason, it's very useful to understand the principles of brain functioning. Maybe is more insightful than the cortex in some respects, because it can be analyzed in terms of cellular functions and microcircuit functions much better than the other parts of the brain. Another example is here. Uh, this is an example of task dependent fMRI or functional magnetic resonance imaging. And here you see activation of the cerebellum together with the rest of the brain. So this is a way to understand how this part of the brain is activated together with the other parts of the brain. Without going into the detail, this example uh, addresses a cognitive function that is the representation of movement and the sensory motor tasks inside the cerebellum, which actually takes part to cognitive processing. Um, 
Another example is here taken from fMRI resting state networks, which are networks operating in resting state when the subject is not performing a specific task. And interestingly, the cerebellum is involved in at least five of the 14 resting state networks. And in particular, three of them are high level cognitive network. One is the DMN or default mode network that operates when the brain is at rest. And uh, another one is uh, the attention network that operates when the, the brain switches from rest to active states. And another one is the salience network that operates when the brain is analyzing a specific salient property of our cognitive sphere. Okay, so the cerebellum is central to cognition, is central to motor control. Uh, now, in order to understand how the properties of the cerebellum at the level of a network of neurons are connected to the properties of the brain and the functions of the brain, we need models. Um, the model can be designed in a way to reconnect the low level made of elementary causes to the high level made of observables. For those who are uh, interested in uh, physics, this is a general theme for the investigation of physical systems, not only the brain. So we are treating the brain as a physical system. The brain generates its operation based on elementary causes, which are, which are the activities of the single cells, and generates observable signals. For example, the MRI signal, or in this example here, uh, a local field potential signal, like those that I have been exploring with Shyam a couple of years ago. So basically, the problem is how the elementary causes are connected to the observables. And this problem can be treated in two ways. As a direct problem, we take a lot of elementary causes, we put them together and we go to the observable. Or as an inverse problem, we have the observable and we want to go down to the elementary causes. Clearly the direct problem is more tractable. If we have a good model in between, that is the model uh, depicted here in the middle, then we can do it. We need equations and we need algorithms that transform the elementary causes into the observable. Um, the inverse problem, uh, which means the inverse function of this system is much more complicated. Mathematically speaking, is a, a problem that can be solved only in special cases in an exact manner. And in most cases, it cannot be solved in, in an exact manner because the system is degenerate which means has a lot of solutions to the same inverse problem. This means also that we have a many elementary causes arranged together that can give rise to the observable. So inverting the problem is not possible in principle, but there are strategies to do it, to do it at least partially. And in this uh, uh, procedures, allow us to infer about some central core parameters of the system that bind the observable to the elementary causes. Um, let's see how the strategy for generating direct solutions to the modeling problem and the inverse solutions of the modeling problem can be mixed up and used in uh, facing the problem of brain modeling. Um, in green, we have uh, biological things, molecular properties, neuron electrophysiology, neuron morphology, microscopic connectome. All these properties can be used to reconstruct the biophysically detailed models of single neurons and networks. The neurons can be simplified, the models can be simplified, transformed into spiking neural networks. The spiking neural networks can be condensed into mean field models. This is what we can do going from biology to models. Now take another line of investigation. We start from brain connectome and large scale activities like those of uh, MRI that I've shown just a couple of slides before. And then we can generate a connectome made of edges and nodes. And we can uh, 
put the neural masses, which are very condensed representations, mean field models, or spiking neural networks into the nodes. In this way, we transfer biology into a high level representation of the brain. This is a virtual brain model. The virtual brain model is a high level representation of the brain that can incorporate biological properties. We are investigating the theoretical aspects and computational aspects of this construct, and we're generating virtual brain models. I will show you some examples. Um, another way to treat the problem is to start from brain theory and that is, uh, generate control systems, like in engineering, in bioengineering. These control systems can uh, be used to generate hybrid closed loop controllers. The hybrid can lose controllers can incorporate again all the properties of biology transported into the controllers from the spike in neural networks or even the mean field models. We didn't try with the mean field models, but we are doing it with the neural networks. So at the end of the story, we have two kinds of constructs, the hybrid closed loop controllers and the virtual brain models that can work in silico as if they were brains. Um, let's go a bit uh, more in depth. Um, this is an example uh, of a neuron model, a single neuron model. This is actually a neuron of the cerebellar cortex, is a Golgi cell of the cerebellar cortex. Um, I hope the uh, screen sharing is good enough to show you that the model lights up sometimes and it generates spikes when it is activated by synaptic inputs. So basically we are doing in silico what the real neuron is doing. This model is quite complicated. It's made of thousands of differential equations. The model is made of compartments, electrical compartments connected together and reproduces the real properties of a single cell. Um, the model can be combined with other neural models connected through simulated synapses, generating a spiking neural network like the one on the right. This is an example of a network of the cerebellum, a piece of a network of the cerebellum uh, that scales up to tens of thousands of neurons or even hundreds of thousands of neurons. Now we're developing models like this one that contains about 30,000 neurons. The same model has already been simulated up to the scale of 400,000 neurons or about half a million neurons. And if you consider that the brain of a mouse, this is taken from a mouse brain, contains about 65 million of neurons, we are already on scale. We're on the scale of the millions of neurons. So, now the problem is that if we go on this way, uh, simulating the whole brain of a mouse would mean having enough computational power and having enough information to reconstruct all the subnetworks of the brain. We're doing it for the cerebellum. There are other groups doing it for the cerebral cortex, for the isocortex, other groups doing it for the hippocampus and the basal ganglia. So at some point, we should be able to put together all these models into a large scale construct and simulate the whole brain of a mouse with high detailed representations of the neurons. Okay, good. So uh, I show you some examples. Uh, this is an example of the map that stays behind that. These are differential equations that resolve the uh, problem of uh, membrane excitability. And those on the right are differential equations that resolve the problem of synaptic transmission. Uh, by combining these uh, equations into large systems of differential equations, one can represent what you have seen in the previous movie. The previous movie is the representation of the solution of these differential equations. Um, this is an example of the very low level of uh, modeling in these uh, um, neural models. Uh, this is a model of the ionic channel for sodium, the sodium ionic channel. The sodium ionic channel is represented by Markov chain, which means a system including uh, many differential equations representing the functional state or conformational states of the molecule. 
uh, eventually what we get out of it is a, a Notchkin axis representation of neuronal, uh, of uh, uh, ionic channel uh, uh, gating. And this can be incorporated into the models. Another example, this is actually taken from Shiam, the Shiam work in, 2000, uh, in 2011. Um, the ionic channels can be dislocated in specific part of the neuron, uh, put at work there, and then used to generate uh, a distributed activation of uh, neurons in space. This is a multi-compartmental neuron. Um, the story of the uh, neuron that you have seen in the previous slides uh, is the peak that here started with uh, electrophysiology in 1998, was transformed in the first single compartment model in 2001, was transformed uh, into multi-compartmental models uh, in 2007, uh, dislocating the ionic channels uh, into the compartments of the neuron. And then finally, uh, the ionic channels were differentiated for their properties among the compartments, uh, coming up to uh, probably the first representation of a neural model in which we have special properties of the ionic channels in the soma initial segments and axon. Uh, this model of 2016 is able to represent, uh, to generate uh, spikes of the proper shape, proper size, proper pattern, to generate uh, spikes that are um, located in the axonal initial segment and then propagate at constant speed and size into the axon. This is not a trivial set of properties and it generates the basis of neuronal uh, coding and communication in the brain. Uh, a very last uh, work that was done the last year, uh, well, two years ago now, uh, discovered an additional ionic channel that uh, regulates the bursting pattern of the neuron. Without going into, the, into much details, this tells you that uh, the realistic modeling of neurons is capable of capturing biology. So biology is transported in full into these neuronal models and can be propagated up to the level of networks. Okay. Um, this is an example of the full network reconstruction of the cerebellum. It's a paper that is currently uh, under uh, review. Uh, and uh, uh, now you see that mor the morphology of neuron is used as a construction principle. So we can use the morphology of neurons to generate the uh, connectivity of the local network and to generate the properties of the local network. Now the local network is transforming input spike patterns like the one down here into neuronal discharges at the several levels. Uh, the colors are congruent, which means neurons in red are the traces in red, those in green are traces in green and, and so forth. And therefore we, and, and the same in the, in the movie. And therefore we have a transformation of the input pattern into an output pattern. This is, microcircuit coding using a causal relationship between input and output through the properties of the neurons. So we are touching the heart of neuronal computation and microcircuit computation as if we were in the microchip of a computer or in the main board uh, of a computer. So this is what the heart of the brain is doing. Uh, now, uh, this kind of simulations can be used to extract high level properties of the microcircuit, like the, the temporal structure of activity, which shows oscillations, resonance, which are fundamental for neuronal communication, coding, and plasticity. And also a spatial organization, like this center surround organization, uh, that allows the system to condense computation into clusters of neurons and to isolate these clusters, making them competing with others. It's the property is a property that is distributed uh, widespread in the, in the brain and is expressed also in the cerebellum. Interestingly, all these properties have been anticipated by models and then have been confirmed by experiments like those using multifocal confocal microscopy and uh, uh, voltage sensitive dye imaging and now also multi-electrode arrays. So all these properties start from biological observations are transferred into models. The models predict the next step, which means some high level properties of the circuit. 
and then models go back to validate the model. Up to now, the process is working fine. So what we can say is that the models are telling us a lot about the low levels of brain computation. Um, this is an example in which we have anticipated the theoretical property of the cerebellum that was uh, set forward in, uh, in 1969 by David Marr. And now I think it is the first demonstration that this property might actually hold into the cerebellum, which is adaptive filtering. Adaptive filtering is the basis of all the uh, activities of the cerebellar circuit. And in easy terms means that when a signal comes into the cerebellum is divided into several lines, is analyzed for its properties like frequency, intensity, delay, magnitude, whatever. And then uh, these properties are modified by plasticity. Plasticity can increase the magnitude, can reduce the frequency, can change the delay. All these kinds of things can happen if we have an adaptive filter in the cerebellar granular layer. The model that we've done is the first uh, uh, attempt to demonstrate the existence of this adaptive filtering and it actually demonstrated that plasticity can transform one filter, the one on the left, into another filter, the other on the right. So this is actually the first case in which the model can anticipate the theoretical predictions that were done on the basis of purely speculative basis. OK, okay good. Um, now the model can be extended higher scales. So we wanted to climb up to the level of brains and the controlling systems. In order to do that, the best thing to do is to simplify the models, bring them down into uh, simplified descriptions. There are mathematical uh, processes that, uh, and tools that allow to do that with a good level of confidence and then embedded them into a simplified spiking neural network like the one that you see here. This is the simplified version of the previous one, okay? It's the same network in simplified uh, version. The simplified net, uh, network is uh, informatically much more tractable, it's lighter. It runs faster on smaller computers and uh, can be embedded into virtual brains and uh, spiking controllers. And this is an example in which this network has been introduced into virtual brains. These are neurons of the spiking network, the one here, that are running into a virtual brain. Now I will show you what is a virtual brain. And the same network has been embedded into the controller of this robot uh, in order to make it move with neurons that are the same neurons that we have investigated in biology. Okay. So, um, this is an example of an assembling of the spiking neural network, the same as before, into a virtual brain. The virtual brain is a, 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 an informatic reconstruction of the brain that starts from an atlas. The atlas in this case is the Allen brain atlas, uh, and in the particular example is the Allen brain atlas of a mouse where we have a, a precise reconstruction of neuronal wiring. Really, basically, the atlas is a reconstruction of neuronal wiring. Uh, the point is that here, into this part of the reconstruction, which is the cerebellum, we have placed the, our neural network. So this network that is the blinking on the bottom right is placed here where I have the mouse. Okay, And this network is wired through all the appropriate connections to the rest of the brain. So this is the assembly of a co-simulator. Uh, finally, this co-simulator will bring into the cerebellum information coming from the uh, real brain and will give back to the real brain information elaborated by the cerebellum. And this is the first example that we can get. This is actually an old one, but much better now, in which uh, the neurons of the cerebellum are working driven by brain activity. So we're beginning to get closer to understand what the neurons and the networks do into the larger scale assemblies of the cerebellum, of the brain, okay? So I told you the cerebellum is useful. It's useful because we have a full blown representations of the microcircuit. And then we have a good knowledge of the wiring. 
of the cerebellum with the brain, and not because the cerebellum is nicer or better, because it is very useful in this phase of the studies. We would very much like to have similar representation for the cerebral cortex or the basal ganglia or the hippocampus and do the same tests with these other networks. That is something that will be coming in the next years. Good. This is the case of the human brain. We are in a congress of cognitive sciences, basically, so we are more interested in the human brain than in the mouse brain. Uh, but I have to warn about the attempt to make the big jump. Uh, suppose what uh, just to consider what happens uh, with uh, physiology uh, and with the studies of Hodgkin and Axley in uh, the fifties and sixties. They worked on the giant squid axon which is uh, uh, 500 millions of years far away from the human brain, okay? But still, what they did was to discover the principle. Once the principle was discovered, it was applied to any kind of living being. Now, now we're using the Hodgkin axon model that was developed for the giant squid axon into the neurons of a human being. So this is more or less the same thing. We're working on the cerebellum to understand the rest of the brain. We're working on the mouse to understand the human brain. Clearly, the scale up requires intermediate steps. Cannot be done in a big jump. So if we put the question, understanding the human brain, it is difficult to answer this question. We have to pass through delicate passages. We have to understand what simpler living beings are doing. We have to understand principle from wherever we can take them from. For example, invertebrates like the giant squid action. So now we're scaling up, slowly scaling up to the brain. However, we can scale up, up to some level of confidence. Okay, we can discuss of it. And in any case, when we take the moves from psychological investigations or we take the move from fMRI measurements, we can't ask too much about the neurons because of the inverse problem that is an ill-posed mathematical problem. Even in the best case, by solving an inverse problem, an ill-posed mathematical problem, we do not have the full understanding of the neurons of that subject that are underlying the fMRI signal. But this is what we can do. Um, this is an example in which MRI is used to reconstruct the structural connectivity up here, this first uh, matrix, and the empirical functional connectivity down here, the other matrix. So one matrix informs us about the connectivity in terms of structural fiber trucks, and the other matrix informs us about the functional connectivity among brain areas. The two matrices are clearly the same in terms of um, areas that we consider um, during an, a resting state uh, fMRI uh, measurement. So now what does the, the, the model does? We have the model made of nodes and edges. In each of the nodes, we place the neural mass or the mean field or the spike in neural network, depending on the, on the fine grain that you want to achieve. Uh, and then this model is simulated. The simulation of the model gives back simulated neural activity. These are not single neurons normally. These are fields of neurons. And this activity can be directly compared to the activity in electroencephalographic recording or in an fMRI recording like here. In this way, we obtain a simulated functional connectivity map. Now, the point is that we can compare the simulated functional connectivity map to the empirical functional connectivity map. And what happens here? This comparison is actually the model inversion. So the problem that I anticipated, we have to invert the model is here. So model inversion passes through optimi an optimization process 
uh, that in engineering terms is uh, uh, minimizing a cost function. And this optimization process uh, means that we can change the parameters of the model in order to make the simulated and empirical functional connectivity matrices as close as possible. We assess the closeness of the two matrices using a parameter that is uh, the Pearson correlation coefficient. Um, when this Pearson correlation coefficient goes higher and higher from zero to one, we improve the more, the more the similarity of the two matrices. And it means that we are extracting the parameters of the brain. Um, normally, this Pearson correlation coefficient goes up to 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. That for the for these complex systems is a good is a good value. And there are ways that uh, um, our laboratory, other laboratories are exploring to improve the fitness and increase the Pearson correlation coefficient. For example, we can improve the mean fields. We can uh, uh, improve the specific directional connectome. We can improve the subnetworks. We can generate a node heterogeneity. Uh, there are many ways to, to do that. And there are several laboratories testing how to do it. And eventually we extract this parameter set, global coupling. So how is the brain wired up? Local coupling, how are local networks wired up? And clearly by speaking about global coupling and local coupling, we speak about plasticity that wires up the network of the brain we can extract local neuronal activity that is the activity inside a node and we can extract the local excitatory inhibitory balance is a fundamental element to, co to govern the activity into the nodes and to balance activity inside the network and between the networks so these parameters are not exactly single neuron spikes but are the salient parameters that govern activity in the network. Clearly, these kind of parameters are also the expression of neurodegeneracy. Neurodegeneracy indicates that in order to obtain these results, we can have different states in the system. Neuron A, B, C, and D can combine in different ways to obtain the same local coupling. So we will never be able to say whether A, B, and C are doing in a way or in another. But what we can say is that their combination caps up to this particular local coupling that is the parameter, the neurodegenerate parameter that we have into our brain model. Okay. Um, an example of this is shown here. This is a work that was done in our uh, laboratories uh, last year in which the cerebellar network, the same that you have seen in the previous slides, has been represented and implemented into the virtual brain. Puzzlingly enough, before this work, the cerebellar network has never been put into the virtual brain, but now it is there. And the point is first, that when we put it into the virtual brain, we have immediately an increase in the Pearson correlation coefficient which means that wiring up the cerebellum with the rest of the brain contributes to what? To global coupling. So global coupling depends on the presence of the cerebellum. And when the cerebellum is in, introduced into the virtual brain model, the global coupling becomes better, okay? The second point is that this network needs to be directionally connected. So connectivity is uh, made of edges and these edges come from, FM, from um, uh, DTI, from diffusion tensor imaging reconstructions. These tracts in principle do not have a directionality, but in truth, they have it. So if we do not put the directionality into the tracts, our result will be less precise than otherwise. Then we have, as we say, uh, technically, we have curated the tracts and we have imposed the directionality that we know from physiology and anatomy. Once imposing the directionality, the results gets even better. So this means that we have space to improve the model 
by imposing parameters that are not directly extracted from MRI, but it can be, uh, let's say, imported from the knowledge obtained from different fields. Um, and finally, another aspect is that the uh, cerebellar subnetwork can be considered separately from the rest of the brain or inside the rest of the brain and can be parameterized directly or indirectly with the rest of the brain. Um, and again, in this case, the subnetwork is demonstrated to play an important role by itself. So the subnetwork can be parameterized beforehand and then introduced into the, into the virtual brain. So all these things uh, tell us that we have a lot of space to introduce the cerebellum, that the cerebellum plays a role for global brain dynamics, and uh, that introducing subnetworks and curating the subnetworks improves the performance of the virtual brain. Good. So that's all the story with the virtual brains. Now I tell you something short for the controllers, and then uh, I will be at the end of the talk. Uh, in the controllers, we do not have the whole brain. We have only the parts of the brain that are theoretically important to generate some function. For example, sensory motor control. Uh, interestingly, in the virtual brains, we are already able to introduce plasticity that was not present in the virtual brains. Uh, it was indirectly represented in the connection strength. Here we can put the plasticity rules, which means the learning rules that the brain uses normally to generate function. Again, the cerebellum is interesting here because it is the heart of uh, error-based learning in the brain. Because of its connectivity, the cerebellum plays a fundamental role for error-based learning. We've wired up the cerebellum that is made of neurons, designed and drawn here, with a controller that generates motion and it generates motion imposing it to a plant. A plant is something that moves, is a robot, for example. Um, and this cerebellum, therefore, receives signals from the command centers of the cerebral cortex and from the feedback coming back from the plant and is able to compare the command to what the system wish to get and the result which is what the system actually is able to do. They never coincide. They normally are generated with some level degree of error. So this error can be compensated by the cerebellum that learns from the error how to compensate the error itself. And this happens autonomously through the learning rules. So we're generating an autonomous system capable of learning and behaving. Uh, this is an example of the mechanisms that are into the system. This, uh, the learning curves and the parallel fiber Purkinje cell synapse in this example. And you see that trial by trial, the Purkinje cell learns to switch off. So blue, which means no spikes, basically. And the trials go from bottom to top on the y-axis. And you see that at some point, the uh, Purkinje cell learns to switch off. This is due to plasticity that is generated by autonomous learning rules that are based on trial and error that is implemented through the circuitry and the internal uh, mechanism of the cerebellar network. Um, at the same time, uh, the deep cerebellar nuclei that are inhibited by the Purkinje cell switch on suddenly in coincidence with the switch off of the Purkinje cell. This signal is actually the compensatory signal that allows the movement to occur in the proper way, avoiding the error. So basically, this system is representing what the brain is doing when uh, learning occurs through trials and errors. I show you a movie that is quite uh, nice. This movie uh, is, uh, uh, in the case of a force field perturbation experiment. And was developed together with the Politecnico di Milano and uh, uh, is uh, using the nice robot that you have seen in the previous slide. This robot is called NAO. And into the brain of the robot, if you can call it this way, we have the cerebellar circuit that you have seen before, the one with all the lights blinking up and down. So now now robot is learning to move the, the arm, but at some point we put a weight on the arm. 
And this weight unavoidably brings the arm down because you have 10 kilograms applied to the arm and the arm goes down. There is an error. The error is the distance between the blue and the red trajectory. Now the robot starts to learn by trials and error using the cerebellar network. And you see that it's learning to compensate the error, bringing back the arm on the correct trajectory. Okay. Um, this is an example of this autonomous learning using the cerebellar network. Uh, made of spiking neurons. There are spike and neurons running into the, uh, the, the controller now. Um, what is happening here is that the weight has been removed and unavoidably the arm lifts up. So now we have to learn in the inverse manner to reduce the strength, the torch on the joints of the robot. Okay, and the robot learns to go back to the trajectory once again. Okay. This is, was just to show you the uh, capability of these models to learn and adapt using spiking neural networks. Now, this is an ensemble figure. This kind of models have been now uh, applied to the robots, have you seen it, control, robotic controllers, to the virtual brains in different ways and different forms. They have already been transformed into GPUs, which means graphic processing units that are hardware accelerators in different ways in, and also embedded into neuromorphic computers, which means that they're already capable of uh, working in hardware, not only in software, which means accelerating by orders of magnitude uh, the speed of computation, which means going toward artifacts that are able to imitate the brain. Okay. Um, Clearly, this technology doesn't stand on its own and needs uh, uh, support of not only from brain modeling and simulation laboratories like ours, but also uh, uh, neuroengineering laboratories for artificial intelligence and robotics. High performance computing, we are connected and wired now with Phoenix, that is the uh, uh, European Center for Supercomputing that uh, uh, wires together the biggest supercomputers in Europe and uh, uh, medical informatics, because we need medical data in many cases, and also brain atlases that give the basis to reconstruct the brain models. Um, our university is becoming a hub now in this center, uh, which means we have connections, direct connections with eBrains, that is this uh, system of uh, facilities, and we stay basically in this point, the brain modeling and simulations, and we are connected to all the rest. Okay. Um, and we offer services for uh, brain simulations, brain uh, model development, and brain modeling applications to medicine and ICT and so forth. Um, I have to thank the group that is taking part to this. Uh, you see Shyam here is working, still working with us inside the human brain project with a part-time project. And uh, we have the laboratories of neurophysiology, neurocomputation and brain modeling and neuroimaging that are contributing to set up what I've shown to you. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, stop here. Professor D'Angelo, thank you. Thank you very much for the insightful talk. Actually, your talk was very informative, sharing a comprehensive understanding of the different top-down and bottom-up approaches and the modeling strategies and the challenges that computational scientist faces during each level of uh, modeling. Sir, is it okay for you to take um, some questions from the audience? Some are eager absolutely, to... absolutely. Please carry on. So you will put them uh, on uh, uh, the chat line or you will... I can read out uh, for I you. Read, uh, you read them. Okay, you read the questions. Okay, okay. So there are a few questions from the audience already. Others, uh, you can um, post the questions in the chat windows enabled at your side to me. I'll read out the questions uh, for the professor. So uh, one participant had asked, like, if we use a reductionist, reductionist approach to abstract the cerebellum, what would be the new functions we can speak of today as a cerebellum's main role compared to the theories from the past? 
It's a very good question. Uh, and uh, yes, I mean, first of all, there are two questions. One is the reductionist approach. I'm not sure it's reductionist. So we need reductionism to understand the uh, low level uh, mechanisms, but then the approach is global because we incorporate these um, um, low level models into large scale networks. So finally, we try to understand uh, how these mechanisms play a role into the ensemble. And that was quite evident from uh, one uh, of the slides. Uh, uh, I go back to that now. For example, um, this uh, slide uh, can tell you something of this. So the cerebellum is here and it is put into the ensemble. No? Um, or another slide that tells that we're not only using a reductionist approach is this one. Suppose now that the cerebellum is here in, the, uh, um, um, in this, uh, um, bottom-up box, uh, but then it goes into uh, the shadowed area, the gray area, that is the, the top-down area. So it's not only reductionist. That's the first point. Um, what we understand more about the theories that have been proposed? Well, um, we have to clarify some terminology. Theory should not be demonstrated. Or if it is an hypothesis, we should work on the hypothesis. The theory should be much more consolidated than an hypothesis. So what was called the motor learning theory by David Marr was so, let's say, logically solid that was called the theory, but it is actually an hypothesis. So we should better call it, in my understanding, uh, Marr's hypothesis. Uh, and actually, it is already 20, 30 years that people are working to understand what are the biological foundations, if the foundations hold, and if this hypothesis is actually a theory or not. For example, let me make you an example. Um, the hypothesis of Marr says that um, the granular layer of computation, the granular layer is the one of which you have seen the movies, basically, okay? is one of the um, generators of questions. Um, if uh, it, it says that computation is sparse, computation is theoretically sparse, but empirically and from the modeling point of view, it is dense. So it's theoretically sparse, but computationally and uh, experimentally, empirically, I would say dense. So we're changing the theory. So we're not confirming Mars hypothesis. We're changing the motor learning theory in a way. And we're not the only laboratory saying that. There are evidence for other laboratories. There was a nice paper entitled Theoretically Sparse Computationally Dense. Not mine, but I agree, completely agree with this idea. What we did with Xiam, uh, with the title of our paper, one of our paper was Dense Clusters. So we discovered that the computation occurred in dense clusters. It was in 2011. So, and the model, and this was discovered using a model. Um, so basically already in 2011. So um, we are addressing this hypothesis and trying to, to understand what it means. Um, another example is this of, um, um, Purkinje cell plasticity, plasticity between parallel fibers and Purkinje cells. The motor learning theory says that there is only one form of plasticity. It is not true. Experimentally and computationally, now we know we need many forms of plasticity to build up learning into the cerebellum. If you have only one form of plasticity, you have a a rapid learning that is rapidly deteriorated and is rapidly canceled and also that rapidly saturates, which is non-physiological, non-physiological and non-physiological. Learning does not saturate, does not deteriorate and does not uh, saturate. So um, basically in order to make learning non-saturating, generalizing and non-deteriorating, you need other forms of plasticity. 
and these other forms of plasticity occur others at the same parallel fiber Purkinje cell synapse that has multiple forms, others at the Purkinje cell to deep cerebellar nuclear synapse, others between mossy fibers and BCN, others between parallel fibers and stalet and basket cells, and others between mossy fibers and Golgi cells. So at, at the, in the end, we have now on our um, um, workbench, about 20 forms of plasticity, not one. The models are contributing remarkably to uh, this expansion of our understanding. Recently, the plasticity is between uh, mossy fibers, parallel fibers and Golgi cells was discovered by a model simulation. And going back to the experiments, it's still unpublished, now we've found it. So, the models are contributing to understand how the system is working. Thank you, Professor Dantelo. Um, I think we can move on with two or three questions. So another participant had asked, could you throw some light on the difference between autonomous learning with learning with artificial neural networks? Okay, good point. So. Um, autonomous learning occurs in a complex system that has feedback loops. So autonomous learning means that you give the system the learning rules and then the system learns autonomously without your intervention. So basically you don't tell the system what the system has to learn. Um, with our system, we can uh, exploit the cerebral, cerebellar loops to learn, for example, uh, force field compensation or perturbation, uh, eye blink classical conditioning, whisking, arm movement, object manipulation. Um, so we can use the same system to learn autonomously a lot of things, depending on how the system around our network, our learning network is organized. So we don't tell what the system has to learn, but we tell the system how to learn. That makes the system autonomous. Okay. Um, an artificial neural network uh, is a human uh, construct that imitates some properties of the neural networks of the brain and takes uh, some principles for true. For example, uses the neurons, uses the synapses, uses plasticity rules. And at least in some cases, learning is not autonomous because it's driven, it's controlled by the user. In other cases, learning has some components of autonomy. So I would not confuse autonomy with artificial because one can make an artificial contrast that is a construct that is autonomous as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, since we are running out of time, I think uh, we can take one more last question. Is that okay? Absolutely, sure. So the, one of the participants had asked, what functions of the cerebellum is not dependent on cortical inputs? Hmm, that's a good point. Um, I would put it in this way. Um, the cerebellum is always connected with the cerebral cortex. And in order to make a comparison between the intention, the motor intention and the sensory outcome, it requires a connection with the cerebral cortex. Actually, the cerebellum, I mean, it's difficult to, to imagine a function of the cerebellum without connection with the cerebral cortex, I would say. Um, there are basically two loops that make the cerebellum work inside the so-called inverse um, cerebellum model and forward cerebellum mode. One is connected to the periphery, uh, but receives information from the cortex. The other is connected back to the cortex and receives information from the cortex, building up what we call the forward and the inverse loops. Um, but in both cases, the connection with the cortex is required. Um, there are examples in which the cerebellum works without the cortex. For example, in uh, eye blink classical conditioning, you don't, you don't need the cortex. 
or vestibulo-ocular reflex. You don't need the cortex. And um, the inputs are coming in all cases from sensory systems. So it is possible to have the cerebellum uh, connected with the cortex and also without the cortex being involved. Yeah. Uh, the mechanism inside the networks is, is the same. Eh? It's not different. The, all, what changes is the input. So the cerebellum can work without the cortex in some cases. Not in, in voluntary movement. In reflexes, yes. In voluntary movement, you need the cortex. Thank you, Professor. So I think uh, we can wind up this today's sessions. Thank you, audience, Thanks. for the interesting questions. Professor, we are really grateful for the time you had spent with us. Thank you once again. Also hope to meet you soon in our Amrita Mind Brain Center. Thank you very thank much. You, it would be great to come back and meet you in person. And uh, thank you very yes. much for the opportunity to talk to all of you. Thank you, Didi. Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Manjusha, for sharing the session. And thank you so much, Professor Ejidio D'Angelo, for introducing us to modeling strategies to treat the problems and the brain modeling strategies, neuronal dynamics. It would not be wrong if I say understanding the networks in a complex region of the human body was so much fun. Thank you once again for the valuable information. <laughs>